Well, thank you for jumping on. I'm super stoked to talk with you. You have such a, 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 a great uh, background and, you know, it's just wonderful to see like the, the traditional medical doctor training with the functional medicine doctor training. And, and then obviously in this day and age, the immunology training that you yeah. have, it's, uh, it's couldn't be perfect, more perfect at this time. Um, so yeah, thanks for, thanks for jumping on here. Absolutely. And I can't wait thank, to kind of, thank you. Excited yeah. to talk to you as well. Yeah. So, um, well, you have this great book. I haven't had a chance to look at it. I'm, I'm so intrigued by it because obviously there's, there's a, in the book's title, just so everyone knows is immu type breakthrough. Um, and we'll put all that in the show notes for everyone. So don't feel like anyone's driving that they need to take that down and get in a car wreck. We don't need any of that. Um, so I want to dive into what immunotype is, of course, because everyone's like, wait a minute, there's a type, right? <laughs> and there's, there's categories. And over the years, you hear from traditional Chinese medicine, you hear from the types of doshas in yeah. ancient Ayurveda. And so this is an interesting topic because the immune system is a little amorphous. It's a little like, mm -hmm. how do you put your finger on it? It's not so mechanical in the sense that, you know, sometimes we can say, hey, we blow our knee out and you just have to replace that, that ligament and you're fine. And the immune yeah. system is a, this network, right? Of cells. It's like, and yeah, receptors. it's like a moving, it's like a moving target. Um, yeah. I say it's, it's like the only system in our body that's nowhere and everywhere, you know, it's sort <laughs> yeah. of like far reaching goes into every part right. of the body. You know, it's yeah. not like, you know, you could point at your heart, point at your brain. And, you know, of course those are right. affect the rest of the body as well, but most people know where it is. Right. Yeah. Whereas nobody can point to their immune system. Right. It's because it's just this net, like you said, it's like a network. It's a, it's a network of cells and, chemicals and chemical messengers and it's pretty amazing and then you just hear these and i want to kind of pick apart all these things because you hear all of these things especially now more than ever like boost your immune system and and what kind of compounds to take of course like everyone knows the vitamin c and vitamin d now and, mm -hmm. and of, of course there's a tons of evidence to support that but also there's all these other things which is why i love the, the career that you've chosen and that is this 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 lifestyle kind of pleomorphic kind of look at this stuff that obviously affects us and our environment and I just spent as I'm writing a book and at all of the endocrine disrupting compounds and all of the chemicals that are surrounding us in our environment so the immune system is this incredible listener and reactor to all of that. So maybe just as a, as a way to start, like, what is your definition? What is your best definition of the immune system? Hmm. So, like I said, I think it's, it is really a network. Um, I say it's our sort of headquarters, right? So, you know, and I guess I can use the, um, the idea of, a, of an army, which, you know, a lot of scientists use when they talk about the immune system, that there's, you know, different cells, which are of course like your generals and your soldiers and your whatever. Um, and they have barracks, right? So they've got lymph nodes that they go to um, we have certain organs in the body that are very immune, uh, important, like our spleen, our kidneys, uh, things like that. And then we have this huge sort of like the central, I would say, station of our immune system is the GALT, which is the gut associated lymphoid tissue. So that's what GALT mm -hmm. stands for. So if you think about it, it's just this massive amount of 
it's really lymph tissue, like almost like lymph nodes that sit one cell layer beyond sort of between our bloodstream and the inside of our gut is this massive amount of intelligentsia. So basically all these immune cells. Um, and that's where a lot of, you know, a lot of the, the work is done, right? So we always have some immune cells that are trolling through, you know, and there's certain, certain immune cells that that's one of their jobs is they're sort of the garbage collectors, you know, they sort of cruise through, they make repairs, they sort of take pieces of things so they can take it back and say like, is this something we need to attack? Do we need to create specialized antibodies or do we need certain kinds of T cells? So there's, it's constant. It's just, it, it's everywhere. So it's this sort of all knowing, um, system in our body that might exist in large numbers in certain places, but really it can go anywhere. Mm. Yeah. It's, it's, it's kind of daunting to think about, right. It's like, and it has to delineate between healthy cells, not healthy cells, viruses, bacteria, pathogen, and it's this constant circulating monitor monitoring system. Um, what just as we dive into that, I'm just like what pops in my head is what got you so kind of curious about the immune system and what kind of paved your way mm -hmm. for that education so, and diving into it? Yeah. So, you know, I and I write this in one of the chapters. There's a whole chapter on stress, which is one of my big favorite things to talk about. But when I was, before I even went to medical school, I sort of graduated with a biology degree and I wasn't really sure what to do. And I, you know, I didn't have a job. I needed, you know, I needed money. So I went and I worked in a lab, which is what a lot of pre-med students do. But I ended up in this lab um, of this very famous, well-known um, scientist whose name was um, uh, Bruce McEwen. He died a few years ago. So Bruce McEwen, for people who are interested in stress and cortisol, was one of the grandfathers, you know, the giants in research looking at how cortisol and how stress in general um, affects our immune system. So I was sort of like in this guy's lab, not knowing anything, you know, running assays and things. And um, so, for example, he termed uh, the term uh, allostatic load. So allostatic load is basically the level of wear and tear on your body, right? So, um, so the projects I was involved in were, you know, looking at how certain stressors, these were in animal models, which I don't like to do, but this is what I did when I was, you know, 21, um, looking at models of chronic stress and how it changed their immune cells. So it was really very early in this whole field of what's called psychoneuroimmunology. So basically how stress, psychology, emotional stress, physical stress, how that literally changes the um, release of hormones, specifically cortisol, and then how that affects our immune system. So that was back, you know, not to date myself, but this was back like in the early 90s. And um, I was there for three years. And then I went to medical school and I sort of forgot about it, quite honestly. Um, and so it really wasn't until I was probably a resident training post medical school in medicine and got interested again in, you know, sort of the mysteries of the immune system. And, um, and then of course, when I discovered functional medicine, it was like, whoa, because in functional medicine, that's, it's like all we talk about is, you know, the immune system and how it affects the body and inflammation. And so, yeah, I think that's, I realized just how important it was in terms of you know, development of disease, really, you can look at almost any disease process. And at the, you know, the crux of that is the immune system gone awry in some way. Right. And man, <clears throat> nothing's more uh, throws a monkey uh, wrench in the works than, than stress, right? And, Absolutely, and yeah. this chronic kind of getting hit with all this stuff. So what I mean, like, I don't know a person on the planet at this point that's not getting hit with some sort of chronic stress that from an adapt adaptation standpoint, we're, we're so behind, right. Yeah. In the way that we've created our modern day mm -hmm. kind of existence. Yeah. Yeah. So what, yeah, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? 
So it's a problem, right? And I think that <laughs> <laughs> it's a problem. And I think also the message I try to get across is um, you really need to address it. It's not because it is sort of silent, right? I mean, you can, you can feel, um, people feel the effects of stress, but you know, it's sort of silent in the way. And a lot of people don't take it seriously. They're like, ah, you know, it's sort of like, whatever, I should meditate or I should do this or I should do that. But they think of it as like sort of, you know, that's at the end of the list after exercise and sleep and whatever, which are also super important. But, you know, um, just the connections between chronic, I'm going to say unmanaged stress, because we all have stress, but sort of, you know, our inability or resistance in in um, changing how our body responds to stress. Um, unfortunately, when we do that for our whole lives, you know, the outcomes aren't great. We, we know that it's associated with everything from heart disease, heart attacks, obesity, depression, anxiety, Alzheimer's. I mean, you know, the list goes on and on and on. So um, my message is you really need to take this seriously. <laughs> like you really wow. need to, uh, you know, and, and it's true, we can't, I mean, yes, we can take some stressors out of our life. Like there's a lot of things that we, you know, even just keeping up with the Joneses and having too much stuff, right? Or being around toxic friends and toxic relationships, staying at a job that you hate. Um, all of these things, right, we have control over. Sometimes we think we don't, but we do. But then, you know, there are the things we can't control, like the death of a friend or a family member, like a financial problem. Like, and, you know, but... The thing is, is that you can't take away all the stress in the world. That wouldn't be good either because evolutionarily it's there for a reason. But what we can do is we can buffer our physical response to the thoughts, the actions, the things that are happening to us. And half the time we're imagining anyway, we're just thinking all this stuff up, you know, we're future catastrophizing, right? About something that hasn't happened yet. So, but that's real because the body, you know, perceives it as a real true threat and so that's where we have to intervene and whether that's through you know cognitive behavioral therapy whether that's through journal journaling tapping meditation like whatever it is whatever works for you you can make your own cocktail of stress management you know interventions and just it's it's about being consistent with them yeah you brought up so much great stuff there because it's like you know, I, I'm, I'm hooked on this word of, a, of an avatar. Like we're all like, I, I'm Darren, that's my avatar. I'm choosing to kind of have this human experience, right? And, and whatever I get hooked on in terms of my stressors or my happiness, or whatever, it, it's, it's very addicting, right? Mm -hmm. Certainly now it, it's justified in this world. We can easily go, well, this happened. So therefore this is going to happen. Like you said, those patterns of catastrophizing is so it it feels like it's it's not in control like it feels like we don't have control of it because so much of it we're so used to it we're addicted to it where we we just do it all the time and this is quote unquote who i am mm -hmm. my gosh that's so challenging right but at the same time it absolutely is something that we can change just on that part alone. What do you find maybe for yourself personally or clinically? What are, what is the best kind of obviously meditations and stuff, but what's that, what's some quick things that people can kind of do? I think of just like taking breaths before a meal, uh, you know, just, just intermediate breakups of the automation patterns. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of people will, you know, when I'm talking to them, they'll say, oh, I meditate, but it doesn't make any difference. And it's because it's because, yeah, anybody could go sit in the corner of a room and meditate for 10 minutes with incense and candles and feel really good for those 10 minutes. But if they don't take those lessons and then apply them when they're in traffic or, you know, in line at the grocery store or whatever, having an argument with someone then it's not going to help. So I think the more appropriate way to say it is more being present and mindful, and then also trying to interrupt those thoughts that come in. So what you were talking about, you know, when you just get these automatic thoughts, it's true. Sometimes we just go with them. 
but you can stop it and say, okay, like literally, is that thought real? Is that a real thought? Is that the truth? What I'm hearing in my brain? And it's something you have to practice over and over. It's almost like when you start to feel whatever emotion you feel, right? You call this like the think, feel, act cycle. So you, you might have a thought it may be sort of subconscious or someone says something or looks at you in the fun in a funny way right and it creates a it creates a physical emotion right anger jealousy whatever and some people just go with it and then their next action is triggered from that instead of being like wait a minute is that thought true like why am i having this thought do i need to listen to it just because it's a thought in my brain doesn't mean it's true right mm. and if you can just be mindful and present and say yeah that's actually not true or that person that looked at me they just might be having a bad day it's not about right. me right. right and then all of a sudden it's like oh the emotion sort of goes away and then you don't feel like you're gonna have to do what if you know whatever that next action was going to be like whether that action was like you punching the wall or picking up a drink or whatever it is right something mm -hmm. that would have you know relieved your stress right. um so i think that's more of it i mean yeah it's that daily intervention of what what is thought is being provoked what's that feeling where's it coming from like really sort of digging and dissecting it mm -hmm. well it's that self-reflection side of things that is so beneficial for I mean, as I continue to cruise in this life, the more reflective in nature I get, the more powerful that is to not repeat patterns and also have, you know, mm -hmm. change those patterns into something that's deemed uh, a lesson I learned and then applied in a better way. And, and those things are so important to do. But you, like you said, it's the life isn't just this incessant kind of, it just keeps coming. Right. Mm -hmm. So unless we change those patterns. So I want to talk a little bit about like, cause we taught, it's so easy to talk about stress from like, I do feel stressed, but also we're getting stressed chronically mm -hmm. in so many different ways all the time. We can yeah. talk about, you know, chemicals, EMFs, mm -hmm. uh, just daily patterns of just literally just being in the car, going 60 miles an hour, like there's low grade stress being in an airplane, like there's just levels of stress. Mm -hmm. So if we understand that chronic levels of stress, wh what are what are the things that they're actually doing to our, our joystick of our uh, hormonal system, as it relates to our immune system? What what pick that apart a little bit? Yeah. Tell, tell, tell the people oh. because because people need to understand that those little things added up over time are creating some big things yeah. because we have so much of it, right? So much right. of the little stressors that are creating problems. Yeah. So, I mean, there's really, you know, there's two types of stress, right? So there's physical stress and there's more, I would say, mental, emotional. Those would cause, I would say those would cause more of a oxidative stress. So more of a damaging of our cells, damaging of our DNA forcing an increased need for repair and an increased need for, you know, a decreased inflammation, right? So, um, so there's that. But then when we are dealing with just day-to-day -day stressors, our body, we actually react differently to acute stress versus chronic stress. So, and this is a little tricky, you gotta think about it. So cortisol, which is our main stress hormone, you know, after we get the big adrenaline surge, and we get into that fight or flight, you know, we get then about 10 minutes later, that's when the cortisol, cortisol starts to go up. And cortisol is actually anti inflammatory. And everybody can sort of think about that, like, when you hurt yourself, or you get poison ivy, you're going to put cortisone cream, right, or you're going to get an injection in your knee with cortisone, right, it's extremely anti inflammatory. When it's acute, so what happens is over time, people would say, well, why would you need an anti-inflammatory response when you're under stress? Because when, for example, say you go and you're gonna go run, right? You're gonna go run a race, something like that, or you're gonna do, you know, if you think about it, evolutionary times, you're gonna go hunt, right? And you might get injured, you might get hurt. So you need that cortisol to be there to 
to do repair, right? It does some other great things too, like gives you blood sugar surges so that you have energy. Great when you're running a race, not great when you're paying your bills. So what happens is over time, if we have chronic stressors, right? It's, you're not just getting that big surge of cortisol and then it's resolving and you're walking away and you're, everything's fine. You're having this little bit of stressor all the time. Your cortisol is constantly being provoked, provoked, provoked. A couple things happen. Our receptors for cortisol, because there's so much, start to get downgraded. Like we make, we have less of them available. So then we have less of that anti-inflammatory response. And then cortisol can cause problems over time chronically, such as lowering production of immune cells, white blood cells, neutrophils. Um, it can lower the production of antibodies and it can also damage the lining of our gut. So it can actually cause intestinal permeability, leaky gut, which is the gateway to so many problems because then it just allows things to provoke the rest of our immune cells and they're like, okay, what's going on, you know? So acute stress can be very good. It can cause what's called hormesis, makes us a little stronger. So think about like getting into like a cold plunge pool, right? Um, exercise is a great, you know, acute hit workouts, weightlifting, all that kind of stuff, great. When things are going on for long periods of time, it's not good. It, it's like a, it, it's it's like a U-shaped curve. It actually acts really, really differently uh, when it's chronic. Yeah, and that's the that's the that's the double-edged sword of something that is again. It's like the the body is is so brilliant. It doesn't do anything wrong, right? It's <laughs> got all these mechanisms that are there to protect us and actually help us thrive. Mm -hmm. But but we keep doing these repeated patterns they're either going to be undermining uh our health or supporting it and that's where like we kind of have to step back in and mm -hmm. and change some of these behaviors like you 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 lay out behaviors and diet and habits and environment all these things are around us all the time and so let's let's dive into i'm i'm totally fascinated with this immunotypes, mm -hmm. right? You've got smoldering, weak, hyperactive, and misguided. Like, yeah. <laughs> what? I'm so fascinated by those terms. What, what, are, what is that? What are the definitions of those? So, you know, this really came out of this idea of, um, you know, being in the field that I'm in, um, we talk a lot about inflammation, right? And we also talk a lot about boosting immunity. But, you know, what comes to me, you know, what sort of came to me was, you know, sometimes some of the diseases we're dealing with have, we don't really need to boost anything. We might need to calm it down, right? We want to like redirect or quiet down, soothe. So, and there's actually underlying sort of biochemical immunologic changes um, that occur uh, when we obviously are inflamed or when we have autoimmune disease or allergies like there's different cells that are more predominant and a lot of that has to do with what are called our t-cells you know t-cells main main big portion of our our white blood cells our lymphocytes um, and then also all of these cells release cytokines. Cytokines are basically chemical messengers and there's you know, over a couple hundred of them. Um, but they direct basically what cells do. So they're sort of like the communication system. And when we get sort of, we can get sort of stuck in, um, uh, let's say for example, let's, let's talk about the misguided immunotype, which are people who have generally autoimmune disease underlying autoimmune disease is almost always some sort of inflammation. So it starts out with a chronic infection. You know, recently um, we've been talking a lot about Epstein-Barr virus that's been in the news. They know now, I mean, we've known for a long time as functional medicine doctors, but they're finally saying, oh yeah, it's true that, you know, Epstein-Barr virus uh, can be associated with the development of autoimmune disease. Okay, Lyme disease, things like that, um, um, chronic stress. So what happens is 
the body makes a normal response, like your T cells are going to make a normal response to kill a bacteria, kill a virus, whatever. And what happens is we start attacking our own tissues because the body gets confused or misguided. So that is the immunotype associated with autoimmune disease. Um, with the smoldering, these are people that are like, they may not have developed an autoimmune disease yet. They may not have, you know, uh, they may ha not have other issues related to getting sick, but they have chronically inflamed arteries, high blood pressure, obesity, diabetes. These are people who are just chronically inflamed. They're over repairing their bodies. And because of that, they develop plaques in their, in their arteries. They, um, you know, develop more Alzheimer's disease, arthritis. So these you know, sort of hot smoldering uh, people, they may not have a lot of antioxidants. They can't put out the fire because they're living a life. A lot of their behaviors are sort of driving them in this smoldering direction, okay? And then people who have um, uh, the hyperactive, these are people who um, it might've started out that they're, they were fighting a parasite or um, some sort of bacteria. And what happens is they make more of a specific kind of T cell called a, um, a T helper cell two. So we call them TH2 cells. TH2 cells, um, they create or they encourage the production of antibodies related to allergies. So things that are called IgE um, uh, antibodies. They, and those are the ones that create histamine. So people with allergies in this hyperactive, you know, immunotype tend to have asthma and eczema because they're stuck in this sort of polarization. And then lastly, weak is a little bit different. These people, these are the ones who really truly need boosting. So they may have trouble clearing infections, getting rid of viruses, they get sick a lot. Uh, they might be more, um, uh, more likely to develop cancer because maybe their natural killer cells aren't as good at trolling and repairing, can um, you know, getting rid of cancer cells. So the weak immunotype is that person. Um, so, but what's interesting is all of the things we do, how we sleep, how we eat, how we exercise, they affect all of these immunotypes. Yeah, so and it goes back to like that holism approach rather than this weird ass reductionism that we've gotten so kind of addicted to as a society. It's kind of a, astonishing to me that really in this day and age, we're, we're still so hyper-focused on this reducing things down to auto mechanics, you know, and just like, oh, that's broke. Let's take this out. Let's burn that. Let's radiate that. And, and, and everything's good and doing nothing to understanding the genesis of how that percolated up, how that popped up, how that materialized, how that showed up in someone's body. And it's just like, it doesn't make common, it, there's no common sense. It doesn't, yeah. and, and, and as a still a wide society, and I hope that more and more people are starting to understand that of what you're saying, um, there's still a huge amount of people that don't fully exercise that. So, so like, a, that's just like a side note. I'm just like, I'm still to this day, I'm just, I'm, I'm astonished that our quote unquote, mm -hmm. I was just at a great interview with this traditional healer um, out of New Mexico. And, and she just caught like this wordology around she's she learned from generations of uh, her, from her grandparents on both paternal and maternal and had all this medicinal herbal curandera knowledge right mm -hmm. and it was funny like people looked at her and said oh you're non-traditionally trained she's, <laughs> she's like, like no i'm really traditional <laughs> no, it's actually but it's you know how weird that sounds when you really know, think about it's, it's like wacky. so it's wacky so it's like traditional in the in the lexicon we somehow flipped this whole mm -hmm. thing and and then we lead with the american medical association as the answers and it's just like it's oh, yeah, it's just insane. it's it's insane you know yeah my my interpretation of i mean i like to call it conventional medicine um is there they're basically they're, they're sort of like 
well, let's just wait and see what happens and we'll wait till you get sick and then we'll, we'll try and fix it. Right. You know, I mean, it's, I see it all the time. It, it's like this complete fear of actually doing harmless interventions that actually might prevent a disease or reverse a disease. Right. It, it's like they're fearful of it. Like it's going to somehow take away their livelihood if, if you talk to someone about how they eat or sleep, you know, like, right. Believe me, you're still going to have plenty, plenty, plenty of patients. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. It, there's it plenty of people that. that are still not going to, you know, follow your your uh, your lead um, because we're human. I got a I got a, a a big question on that point. If you were given the wand of like, I mean, I don't even want to kind of call it Surgeon General because it's just kind of it's a fish within the fishbowl still, mm -hmm. but yeah. let's just, let's just kind of say if, if you could change the way our healthcare system is set up, what are some of the, obviously it's a massive question. What are some of the things that you would go about doing, maybe educating or mm -hmm. setting out to do? You know, well, there's a couple of things. I mean, it's so hard to unpack, but you know, you can start with education. I mean, yeah. you know, I write in the book that, and this is true is that, you know, the people that we put our health, you know, we put the responsibility of our health onto have no, edu no education in nutrition. I really think that the, at the level of the medical school level and residencies, we need to be learning more integrative medicine. We need to be learning this stuff. I think really they should change that completely. The other problem is that so many of the things that are would save people's lives and prevent things aren't covered by insurance so for perfect example vitamin d testing vitamin d is like a super amazing it's really a hormone but it's something that many of us don't produce enough of and we know that it's totally linked to autoimmune disease. We know that people have more infections. I mean, there's studies showing people died of COVID more readily or put on a ventilator because they didn't have adequate vitamin D levels. We know this. This is something that is so dirt cheap to test for. I think it costs like $7. Our Medicare does not cover it. It's like completely insane. Hearing aids, we know that in, you have increased dementia when you lose your hearing. And so right at the time that we're at our most vulnerable and we're starting to have increase of dementia and Alzheimer's disease, people can't afford hearing aids because they cost a thousand dollars or more, right? And we know that, that you need that auditory input in order to keep certain parts of your brain awake. And there's studies showing this. You can accelerate dementia by you know, having hearing loss. Like just crazy stuff like that. Like, you know, one of our biggest issues is Alzheimer's disease, but no, we're looking for billion dollar drugs that none of them work anyway, right. instead of, you know, covering hearing aids for people or covering vitamin D levels for people. So insane. Yeah, or eating more plants and lowering plants, yeah. fast food and all this stuff. I mean, that is great. Uh, neurologist, uh, Dr. Scherze is do tons of work mm -hmm. on, on just like, the evidence is just mounting oh, yeah. about all, all, all the ways that you can lower that also that inflammatory yeah, response and feed a, your brain with with right. you know healthy fats and antioxidants and it, like i don't think any neurologist they just go oh well there's nothing we can do yeah and i mean to actually you, tell people that is really sad too they could just say i don't know that would be more helpful <laughs> yeah. yeah well they they would have to put their set their ego aside in order for them to say they probably don't like the the the, the three mm -hmm. the three words they probably yeah. don't like that and um because they've spent all this time and money into that resource i mean you thought talk about there's so much there's so much power in the compounds and the plants that are sitting there right mm -hmm. there you talk about yeah. vitamin d you talk about um i mean things like turmeric and curcumin mm -hmm. and like these things are just like dirt cheap yeah. and so protective and you talk about yep. neuro neurologically protective it's like mm -hmm. i think every week curcumin has another study that comes out it's just there's um i think there's over 120 human studies which is amazing 
Because yeah. most, you know, there's not a lot of money put into testing food compounds, especially in the United States, because it's yeah. all pharmaceutically driven. But, you know, there are actually a lot of studies looking at uh, curcumin mm -hmm. um, because it hits so many levels at so many different cellular levels in terms of shutting down inflammation. It doesn't just have one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. It it intervenes so many different places. It's like the superstar really is. Right. And that's a beautiful thing about the, the this just inner this incredible interaction between the plant world and the human world, and that there's not this line, and this line that is created in some of the drugs and the and the shots and things like that, where they just have this linear approach, and then of course the the instead of this pleomorphic benefit list, it's got this pleomorphic kind of you know uh, stress response and side effect list. Mm -hmm. And it's just oh, like the side effects are ridiculous. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it, it's crazy. So like people listening to this going, how, how can they, and I, I think you have some great quizzes and stuff in the book mm -hmm. where people can yeah. start exercising their understanding of maybe where their immunotypes are sitting. Mm -hmm. yep. so, yeah. So people can check that book out from there and then, yeah. So you can go, um, the quizzes are in the book. They're also, um, it should be up on my website in a couple of days because we just revamped the website. So I think right. it's launching next week, but the quiz um, should be, I think, on the front page. So, you know, they can take that for free. Um, and it really just gives you a sense of where you are, you know, out of balance um, because we're all sort of slightly out of balance, right? Yeah. And then there are just, I mean, there's some things that are pretty much good for everyone, but for specific, um, sort of immunotypes, there are, you know, maybe things that might even be more beneficial, mm -hmm. you know, to, to sort of hone in on. And then also people have their specific issues. Like I have people come in and say, you know, I, I've got my nutrition dialed in. It's awesome. I work out every day. Um, but like my, my sleep is a wreck. I get, you know, mm -hmm. five hours of sleep and I travel and you know, I have insomnia and all this kind of stuff. So like, that's their thing. That's their thing that they have to work on. Um, you know, cause it's really about just trying to shore up as much as you can, right? You want to, you want to, um, block as, you know, fill every hole or as many holes as you can. Yeah. Um, you may not, you know, be able to do all of it, but as much as you can, you want to really improve your life as much as, you know, as you're able. Well, that's a great analogy too, because it's almost like sometimes we don't realize where there's a leak mm -hmm. and where there's kind of, you know, that susceptibility and, and, you know, and that, and that's, that's where we're the, the, you know, I term this, the, this thing called fatal conveniences where we, we, we think we're doing something good, but mm -hmm. in reality, it's kind of, it's kind of leading us towards a place that we don't want to go. And, and so, yeah, so th those kind of patterns uh, are, are important for us to go, oh, wait a minute, I need to plug this hole or I need to do something different. From a general perspective, what do you think are some of the biggest, you know, plugging of holes that people should absolutely be doing right now to fortify, improve their general immune well-being? I mean, I mean obviously the the easy ones that you've mentioned are the sleep and the exercise and things like that. Mm -hmm. But how about diet and more of the sure. compounds or whatever? Right. So, you know, um, I think people need to take a very honest look at their diet. You know, people, <laughs> our memories aren't so bad. I mean, it's so yeah. great when we look, Oh yeah, my, you know, and cause people will come in to see me and I have a nutritionist who works with me and, um, They'll say, oh, my diet's really pretty good. And then, you know, she has them use chronometer, chronometer. Um, you know, you can use other apps. That's one we use. And we have them do like a five-day food diary. We're like, don't, don't try to make it look good. Just be completely honest. Like, we don't care. Like, we're starting from scratch. Just put out whatever. And it is amazing what people think, you know, is healthy or good for them. And we're like, oh, you know, we start looking at like the amount of, you know, their eating what they're eating and you know the sugar that they're taking in and you know sort of the fake food and you know it, it's just hilarious and we're like okay this is totally not optimized um so you know i always recommend that 
you know, people do that for themselves, like really be honest. And then, you know, you can look and see like how much fiber you're getting, how much protein, how much, you know, all the macronutrients and you can see all the micronutrients too. And start there, like I'll go, okay, I have not had vitamin C in three days, right? You know, so like maybe I should eat more, you know, citrus fruits and, and uh, you know, red peppers and strawberries and kiwis or whatever. So, you know, you can really sort of hone in on that. Um, I think fiber, you know, uh, people talk about, it's been really big in the news lately, right? In the health news is that, you know, fiber, uh, we're a fiber deficient nation. Um, we focus way too much on, on uh, making sure we get enough protein. Uh, and some people don't get enough protein, but most people get adequate protein, um, but they do not get adequate fiber. And right. who, who counts their fiber? Nobody's counting their fiber, they're counting their, their carbs. So um, that's a big deal because um, we need it for detoxification, we need it for bowel health, we need it to feed our microbiome. Um, so fibers like, you know, and if you eat a lot of plants, yeah, it's great. You know, you're way ahead of the game. So, you know, you can also just focus, focus on plant foods as much as possible. You know, have people, if they're not, you know, if they're not vegan, vegetarian, say, you know, have at least one day a week that you're vegan, you know. Um, and just really ramp, really try to be like super competitive about your fiber intake. Like, yeah, like I'm going to hit, you know, 25 grams today. Um, so that's a good place to start. You know, I think I had 25 grams for breakfast with for breakfast. a big fruit bowl. It's amazing. Like, yeah, yeah. How, like that's, that's the, that's the minimum requirement for women. Um, women, uh, men, uh, for whatever reason, I actually don't know the science behind this, but they, uh, it's closer to 35. Mm. Um, but um, yeah, people people don't understand the concept of that because they're like, oh, what does fiber do for you? You know? Right. Well, maybe men are just full of shit, so they need yeah. to scrub a little more. <laughs> they understand it when they have to go to the bathroom and they're like, oh, I'll just take some Metamucil. But, oh, um, you know, so that's a big thing. And I think, you know, you brought this up in the beginning, um, but um, toxins, quite honestly. And I think it's easy for people to get overwhelmed. And again, this is, as you said, it's sort of a, you know, a, what do you say? Inconvenient, uh, convenience, fatal, fatal, fatal convenience, right? Yeah. Um, so, and that's the way that, you know, we live our modern world and, you know, people are like, well, I'm not giving that up. And like, well, you don't have to give up everything, but let's right. just sort of look and see what are the things that you use every single day? Right. You know, what do you brush your teeth with? What do you put underneath your arms? You know, if you use deodorant, what do you shower with? What, you know, what are the things that contact your skin or that you breathe in or that you eat, whatever? every single day because that's the thing that's probably impacting you the most and then yeah. just make changes around those you know start with three things yeah um we know that over time that builds up so if you can just make those small changes and that's not something that has to be expensive it's not something that like you have to give up every convenience totally. um but that's really important because you know toxins act like distractors they're the major distractors of our immune system they're behind allergies for sure absolutely um, they're behind inflammation for sure. Then they're behind autoimmune disease for sure. So they can, they can impact all of those issues. You know? Yeah, it's, it's crazy, uh, in terms of that, when you literally start to understand what mm -hmm. endocrine disruptors are doing and mm -hmm. binding the receptors and pushing Bad out. Obesity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, 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 it's astonishing. And then yet, you know, the thing that scares me a lot, Dr. Heather is that, like you can even see FDA, EPA, FCC, USDA, you can see that they write articles about this stuff. Mm -hmm. And yet they're very, doing very little to actually mm -hmm. regulate it and even calling it out. Yep, yeah, it's a probable car carcinogen. It's a known endocrine disruptor. And yet mm -hmm. it's in the bibs of our, uh, the children. It's like, yeah. it's just in that. So those are important things. And, and, and I think the thing that you said is so important. Don't be overwhelmed by this stuff, but small changes added up over time mm -hmm. will then minimize the exposure that we, that we all are getting exposed to. And it doesn't matter if our brains are like, I don't want to deal with it. Guess what has to deal with it? <laughs> our bodies, our right? Bodies, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it's, it's still being impacted. I think that's, a very, very important thing for all of us to understand. It's like, but, but also going back to what you said about, we have to know 
what is truly going on and take this realistic approach. Like if it's the, like you said, that what, what was it? The chronometer? Uh, oh, yeah, the chronometer, yeah. Yeah, That's so that app, thing. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. so you can plug in your food, everyone, and you can then literally know the serving, you know, the put in the serving size, what you ate, and it will spit out your nutrients, perceived nutrients based on, I think it's the USDA's kind of right, on, yeah. ongoing updated researched data bank based on what an avocado is giving you. Mm -hmm. uh, and so then it spits out like what your fiber is, what your vitamin A is, what your protein is. And like you said, I think I haven't met a person that said I'm eating just fine. And then when you really look at it, they're not like, yeah. like, it's, no. yeah. yeah. And you know, it takes practice and a lot of times, but I think it's that acknowledgement and that discovery that yeah. is what gets you to wake up. Right. Because if you don't look, it's sort of like not opening your bills. Like, what are you going to, you're not going to know right. what you owe and whatever, right. if you just ignore them. But a right. lot of people we do that. It's like the people who ghost you when they have a difficult conversation to make, you know, that just feels uncomfortable because, you know, as human beings, we're, we, we move away pain and, and uh, from pain and discomfort and towards things that make us feel better, at least in the moment. Right. So, um, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to be honest with yourself and say, you know what, wow, I really have a, I might have a hand in how I feel and my illness or my health, like, uh, you know, and, but I mean, once you start, you know, you sort of rip off the bandaid and you're like, okay, like this is reality. This is where I am right now. So then what can I do? And I think that that really starts to empower you. And then you're like, oh, I'm so excited. You know, like I ate more fiber today or mm -hmm. like, you know, I got rid of, uh, you know, my scented laundry detergent or <laughs> right. throughout, I got stopped, you know, I stopped drinking diet Coke or, got rid of my plastic uh, Tupperware, you know, I mean, uh, these are things that you like, you know, you can be like, I'm sort of proud of myself now, because I know that down the line, this is going to be really beneficial. So yeah. um, I think people always think it's going to be painful, like it's always gonna be like, Oh, this is gonna be so hard. But actually, it's really not. And yeah. you get a lot of pride from making these health improvements. And then all of a sudden, you're like, wow, I actually sort of feel better, you know, I, I think this is such an important part of the health journey, I think. It's Absolutely. Like, it's like that congruence when you line yourself into like what you want your life to be. And then you add those things up and that, that, that self empowering sovereignty that just keeps building and building and building. And like, if you get yourself tested for your vitamin D levels tested for $7, and then a few months later, after you made some changes, you see it, right? You mm -hmm. put your food into the chronometer three months later after you've made some changes. And all of a sudden you're like, wow, look at all of the nutrient density my body is receiving that it wasn't receiving before. And I think this is a very, and what's going on in between the ears and our points of view of ourselves. And like you said, this is where the self-confidence mm -hmm. really starts to build. This is like, yeah. this is self. This is like, the things that you can do to nurture yourself on the deepest level. These are little prayers that we can do all the time and like yeah. getting more hydrated and, you know, just moving the body. And like, it's, it's a beautiful thing, but this is, this is at the corner of it all, I think, because like you said, I mean, the biggest thing is I, I'm so overwhelmed with changing that just mm -hmm. that the act of thinking of changing, I'm stressed out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think also people have a state like change can be uncomfortable because sometimes you do have to get rid of things that you think are like your crutches, sure. but they're really not, you know, right. it's funny. We were, I was reading an article the other day about comfort food and how actually, you know, they did these studies where they had people watch this sort of depressing, disturbing movie. They interviewed them before and they said, what's your comfort food? What makes you feel better? And, you know, some people say ice cream, some people mac and cheese, whatever it is, right? So they took these people, they had them all watch this really horrible, you know, disturbing film and they had to sort of write down how they felt. And then some were given a comfort food of their choice some were given nothing and some were given like a neutral food, you know, like some other food. And 
the only variable that actually improved these people's moods after this was time. So basically, the people who ate the comfort food felt no better. It didn't make their mood better. It didn't make them feel, it didn't accelerate how they felt. They all just felt just as horrible until like things just sort of passed. So we have this concept, like we have this misconception too. We get caught up in these stories that we tell ourselves, like I'm fat, I'm always going to be fat. My mom was fat, whatever. Or, you know, we sort of hold on to these things that keep us trapped, you know, like we own our diseases. We, we, it's almost like we can't see beyond what is here right now. We can't see the possibility because it, it feels too hard or too uncomfortable. But, you know, that's why I'm, always, I'm really big about like those small wins because you start to trust yourself and you start to believe in yourself and you start to see like changes and you're like, wow, I did that. Like that was me, you know? It's, it's so, this is, it's so necessary right? It's so powerful, because it's also we take that power back, that we so easily give away. And we go back to like the full circle talking about the, the, the non traditional traditional doctors right. that don't know anything about vitamin D or vitamin C, nor, or, or they're not even looking into it, or they're not even recommending it. You take that power back and say, you know what, uh, I can, I can do what I know is right for me. Because I got my test done for seven dollars, I know that I need to improve. You know, you know what I mean. And that, yeah. and that is is such an important aspect. We all need to take personal responsibility mm -hmm. for ourselves and find doctors like yourself that have this broad view, and also view people as their individuals. Their mm -hmm. they have individual biochemistry. They're getting hit with a, a million billion quadzillion different directions how the hell can we have a uniform anything mm -hmm. <laughs> right but yeah. uh yeah it's it's it, this this type of thing i think is uh, i vote for you so if you <laughs> if, if you get to be at the the forefront of changing the 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 way we're looking at it i say let's do it i think yeah. i think i think, um, I think changes yeah. you know people are slowly but surely really just getting fed up and taking totally. you know situations in their own hands or finding people to work with they're making changes on their own and mm -hmm. um you know not it's there's always going to be outliers but i think a lot of people are starting to realize like wow the wool's really been pulled over my eyes like for a very very long time and i i trusted in this institution i trusted in my doctor mm -hmm. and i feel like i've been led down the wrong path right you know yeah uh, it's a beautiful time, actually. You know, I think it's, a it's. I think it's actually really exciting, and yeah. you know, I'm very like egalitarian. I welcome all. You know, I I think that one of the worst things that happened to um, medicine was all the uh, the power was taken away from doctors, and then all the legality, all you know, the litigation. I mean, doctors used to be able to think outside the box and like you know come up with theories and ideas and. I don't mean like experiment on people, but really right. sort of like really think outside the box. But now people who think outside the box are called quacks. Yeah. And, um, you know, it doesn't mean that we should be doing things that um, would be potentially harmful or giving people lies and telling people that they have cures. And because there are those people out there yeah. um, or some people who have absolutely no background and have no business telling people what to be doing with their bodies. Um, but at the same time, I mean, doctors are so cautious now. They, they just sit and wait, and, you know, because they don't want to try anything. They don't want to do anything. They don't want to do anything that might be slightly off, you know, what would be the recommended thing to do. And that's so, not only is it uninspiring and not, you know, creative, it's boring, and it's really not helpful. Right. Well, the, 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 you know, we've got to get back to healthy healthy conversation yeah. dialogue and like like you said i think that the, the innocence of like and the creativity using knowledge and questions and curiosity you know when we're presented with a problem the human spirit is one of the greatest things to employ at that point to go like okay here's a problem what can i do I can lean on my knowledge, I can look, I can discover, I can ask colleagues. That is 
clearly part of our human, you know, expansion, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. and, and to divorce that now or to re to fire it back up is, is, is so necessary across yeah. the board, across every industry, across mm -hmm. everything, you mm -hmm. know, and that's where I think, you know, coming together with people like yourself finding that those community you finding your community of doctors where you can actually do that and then that's serving that's serving the greater good at that point yeah you know it's really funny um when i started doing integrative medicine i went to the andrew weil program in arizona mm. <laughs> um and i it was just amazing you know because here i'd been like a doctor for 10 years and working in a practice, pretty much like shoving pharmaceuticals down people's throats and whatever. And um, I got to this, you know, this program with these, you know, these doctors from all over the country, a lot, they did all sorts of things. There was radiologists, cardiologists, primary care doctors, whatever. But it was like, they all wanted to do something different. And it was like, you just found your tribe. Like, it was so cool. Like, I was like, oh my God, this actually exists. I didn't know you know, that there were people like me that really wanted to, you know, to make these changes and to discover it. It was just so refreshing because I was like, oh, I can have all these great conversations. We can talk about all this stuff. We can talk about mind body stuff. We can talk about shamanism. And it was just so cool. Um, and that really just made me love my, my career choice so much more because I was really starting to get discouraged. So yeah, it's a super exciting time. That's awesome. Yeah. When you find your tribe, man, it's like nothing better, yeah, you know, what else is possible at that point when you yeah. find that openness and that willingness to change and create something different. Well, Dr. Heather Mode, this has been so fun. Uh, I can't wait for people to, to hear this and check out your incredible book, Immune Type Breakthrough. Um, Keep being the renegade, keep being the smart, intelligent, badass that you are. Um, I'm just uh, grateful uh, for what you're doing and what you're committed to. Thanks, Darren. This was super fun too. And uh, you keep doing what you're doing, because which is amazing as well. Um, you know, reminding people of the incredible richness in the world that we have in terms of just, you know, what's out there and what's possible in terms of food and nutrients and, you know, it's you got to connect back with mother earth you know um yeah there's so much that people can do for themselves it's, a, it's amazing mm -hmm.